school and not at church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was founded as a result of a divine vision and divine revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The school was incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. The school, there are classes are held in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Lansing Branch was established in 1973. The Dean of the Lansing Branch is Dr. Terry Welch, and the superintendent is Dr. Tim McNamara. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name of the Father, Word, or Son, and Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim, and it has been improperly substituted with God. The name of the Holy Spirit, manifested in or out of a physical body, is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted with Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in his pure spirit state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word our son. A superincorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua, the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So this simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. 
In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you to find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua Messiah, without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern, practical and occult, science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with a hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we'll have a prayer by a visiting member from Denver, Colorado, Dr. Margaret Pink Scales. We'll have Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, to be read by our superintendent, Dr. McNamara. We'll have some selections from our choir. We'll have announcements at the end of class. This evening, we'll have Dr. Namera and alternate will be determined. Up, up. You gotta do these fun things that you're on. Let us bow our hearts and minds unto our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, giving him thanks for calling us by name to come into this class to learn of his purpose, his pattern and plan of salvation through his son, Yahshua the Messiah. We wanna thank you, Father, for your many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And we ask that you um, continue to give us the strength and all that might to endure until the end. In Yahshua's name, let us all say hallelujah. Good evening, class. I apologize for my appearance. I just got out of work and came straight from work. So, sorry for my slovenly look. I'll be reading Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, out of the King James Version of the Holy Name, or Holy Bible, and the version of the Church of England, which is probably the only version I've ever. Bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. 
and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And the death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places, whither I have driven them, saith Yahweh of hosts. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, thus saith Yahweh, shall they fall and not rise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual black backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course, as a horse rusheth into battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of Yahweh. How do ye say, We are wise, and the law of Yahweh is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of Yahweh, and what wisdom is in them. Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one of the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covet covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith Yahweh. I will surely consume them, saith Yahweh. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. And the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves, and let us enter into the defense cities, and let us be silent there. For Yahweh, our Elohim, hath put us to silence, and given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against Yahweh. We looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come, and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For, behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith Yahweh. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold, the, vase, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not Yahweh in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black, astonished ha astonishment hath taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of my why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Jeremiah the eighth chapter. And thank you, Dr. McNamara. And at this time, choir.
you do. Mm -hmm. In the yonder days, Noah told the people it's gonna rain. But when he told them, they paid him no mind. And when it happened, they were left behind. I'm saying it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain. You better get ready and bear this in mind. Y'all showed no one with a rainbow sign. It won't be water, but fine next time. Water came crashing, not just from the sky. The fountains of the deep ripped open, oh my The people had nowhere to go So the fish had a feast Ask Jonah, he knows I'm saying it's, it's gonna, gonna rain, rain It's gonna rain You better get ready and bear this in mind Y'all showed no one with a rainbow sign It won't be water but fine next time No one can went into the ship Y'all sealed the door trip a warning was preached for 120 years so brothers and sisters please open your ears i'm saying it's gonna rain it's gonna rain you better get ready and bear this in mind y'all showed no one with the rainbow sign it won't be water but fire next time what does this all have to do with me a fire burns a body immediately a spiritual body lasts eternally And so will the fire I'm praying for thee I'm saying it's gonna rain It's gonna rain You better get ready and bear this in mind Y'all showed no one with the rainbow sign It won't be water but fine next time It's gonna rain, it's gonna rain You better get ready and bear this in mind Y'all showed no Made with hands 
just who you Caught up in a world they say happened by chance They want to believe that it's all in their hands They try to convince me they shape their own destinies But if they knew ya like I knew ya they get down on their knees Yes, if they knew spreading around divine intervention is nice if God is ever around they don't want to believe their every step was patterned by him that he's got it wrapped up tight line upon line they're going back to spirit again he's got it wrapped up tight line upon line they're going back to spirit again your ways before I made the deep blue sea. I know we have a visiting member from our Denver branch, Dr. Margaret Klinkscales. Margaret. And at this time, we're going to open up the floor for testimony up into the 8 o'clock hour. So the floor is now open for 
short testimonies. Good evening, everyone. And it is indeed a pleasure to be, to stand before you and to profess Yahshua the Messiah. And it's a hard thing to get up, but when you think about what you know compared to what the world knows, we have so much to be thankful for. So let's start with Moses. Because when I came in this school, that's what, that was the first thing I heard. And the thing that we heard from the very beginning is what's going to take us on out of this, this creation. That thing was Moses. And you can start with let's start with Exodus 2. That's, that's a good place to start. Exodus 2 and 1. Mm -hmm. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to, and took to wife and, and daughter, took to wife a daughter of Levi. Mm -hmm. And the woman conceived and bare a son. So first of all, what that's telling you is this. There was a man who was of the house of Levi. Is that what it said? And then he took the wife a daughter of the house of Levi. So that's going to tell you right there, that gives you a little genealogy. For those who like to do a little genealogical research, that is Moses' father. But the fact that he came from the tribe of Levi, because we'll find out later on that there were 12 tribes camped around this tabernacle. But the Levites weren't one of them in the sense that it was a the tribe, the Levites, they camped around the tabernacle, but they were in the innermost part, and their function was as the priest. So Moses is of a priesthood. Go ahead. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw, when she saw him, he was a goodly child. She hid him three so months. So what made Moses a goodly child? See, they already kind of gave you some clues back there, the fact that he was born of a priesthood. Now, that is just a physical, carnal um, clue. Because we're going to find out as we go along that Moses is a type and a shadow. Well, I didn't learn that until I came into this school, that Moses is a type and shadow of, our heavenly, of Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, those are some words that I, I don't know if you guys... They don't use those words anymore, type. What is a type? And what is a shadow? Can you look up the word type? Because, see, we throw these words around like everybody should know what that means. And that's one of the things I heard in here when I first came here. And somebody explained to me what a type was because I, I didn't grow up with my mom and dad saying, now look, girl, that's a type. No, I learned that in this school. So what is a type? Type. A group of persons or things sharing common traits or characteristics that distinguish them as an identifiable group or class. So this type is going to identify Moses and where he came from. So it identifies Joshua or Moses as being, or Moses as being someone that is going to identify or point out Yahshua Messiah, because 
Everything that he does is going to be, and we'll learn that too once we come into the school, that everything that you see on this chart, and this is the chart on the pattern or plan of salvation. Woo! Salvation. We got, we, that's, that's not something I, I heard. You know, I mean, I, I heard about, oh, Jesus was my personal savior, but this is a chart on the pattern of plan. So there's this plan from the very beginning that salvation was involved here. And I lost my train of thought because I was going somewhere else when I read that. Oh, um, well, anyway, I'll think about it in a minute. It'll come to me. So um, this chart that Dr. Kinley had painted is set up so that it will bring you, oh, that's what I was going to talk about. It's going to bring you up to Yahshua the Messiah because the one of the things that, and I don't know why it struck me like this when I first came in here, but someone pretty much told, said to me, and, 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 and I know it was the Holy Spirit through that person, that all of these charts, the way they're set up in this school, they're not set up haphazardly. They're set up to lead you by a method. And I was thinking about what uh, Margaret had said the other day, because she was raised a Methodist. And, and I've learned that since been in the school that a Methodist, well, we're, we're the true Methodist, because this is the only school that goes by the true method that Yahweh gave from the very beginning. So these charts are all set up by a method. And they come all the way down, this being that chart on salvation. You come all the way through here, and I saw, you see how these little red arrows point to Yahshua the Messiah, to his death, his burial, resurrection. But it doesn't stop here, because this is what I learned in the church, that he died and he was on the cross. And so therefore, I wore the little cross with, 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 with the dead Jesus on it. But what I didn't learn until coming into the school was that he ushered us into a, a, new, a new age, a new kingdom, and that he's forever, living forevermore as a living Elohim in you and me. And so I didn't learn that, though, just by haphazard. It didn't just, he didn't just jump and say, okay, this is how it is. He brought me into the school and he showed, and he began with Moses, and that's kind of where I wanted to go back to Moses. So Moses is of the tribe of Levi. His parents are. And you can continue to read. And when she could not, when she could not longer hide him. So wait, let's, let's kind of backtrack. Moses' mother and father, there was a death decree that was um, given by this particular pharaoh that all the boy babies, and I'm, I'm trying not to go into the story of Yahshua, but all the boy babies were to die. And as we read, we'll find out that the midwives could not keep up with these Hebrew women as they gave birth. So continue to read under this death decree that was given. Because we'll find out later on that, like I said, Moses is a type of Yahshua the Messiah. Yahshua was born under a death decree. Herod put out a death decree to kill all the baby boys. He was looking for the Messiah. Continue. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark. Of now, now, why would she take an ark? See, none of this that we're reading is, is haphazard. I read those things when I was in, in Bible school, when I was a child, that Moses' mother put him in an ark, uh, and it was called an ark back then. It hasn't changed. <laughs> you know, so guess what? We'll find out that Yahshua is the ark of safety. So there's, that's why there was an ark here. That's why, and, and, you, and you will find out that this ark here can, had the same stuff that the ark had on that, Moses' mother, the slime and pitch, same description, because it's pointing to the same ark, which is, or the true ark of safety, which is Joshua the Messiah. Continue. An ark of bulrushes 
and dabbed it with slime mm -hmm. and with pitch. Mm -hmm. And there's significance behind that too. Go ahead. And put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. Now, Brink. I grew up, um, now even before I saw the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, I grew up thinking that this child was floating on a river. In fact, I was watching, um, what's that uh, children's, the veggie, veggie tales. Do you know that the veggie tales had a bunch of arcs floating on the river? You know, it's just amazing what Yahweh causes you to see now. But I was watching veggie tales, which is a child, children's, a, a little kid's uh, cart, um, entertainment, uh, educational, but it's Christian based to teach children about God, and they've got all these arcs floating down the river. And I'm like, that's, no. First of all, there was only one ark, but the fact that they've got him floating down the river is, t is totally erroneous because she put that ark, no mother who was trying to save her child, that's because there's a death decree out, and this is a grievous thing, this death decree. It's a grievous thing. You've been commanded to kill your child. You've been commanded to kill your child. And then if you won't do it, your neighbors have the right to do it. So she puts them in, a bull, in, a, in this ark of safety. And see, these words all have prominent meaning now that we know what this is all about, that there's salvation involved. She puts him in this ark, and she lays him by the flags on the river, on the river Nile. This river Nile gave forth life because at certain times of the year the Nile was fertile and the the Egyptians had God's many and Lord's many first Corinthians 8 5 15 I can't remember exactly but there are Lord's many and God's many and that's what the Egyptians were they were a polytheistic society and they had a God for everything so of course with the Nile giving forth bringing forth all kinds of causing the fruition of the land this, 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 um, well, we're, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So she lays him by the flags by the river's brink. Why would she do that? Why would, why would, why would she put him there? See, I didn't have the sense to think like, the, to ask these questions before I came into the, into the school. And I say that very carefully. Before Yahshua brought me, then set me down before him. Um, I, had, I didn't have the sense to ask the question, why was she put him in an ark and why was she put him by the flags on the River Nile? And we've come to find out, like I said, the Nile gave forth. But as we read, continue. And his, sis and his sister stood af afar off. So Moses had a sister who stood afar off to find out what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to, to wash herself at the river. So now the Pharaoh, daughters, who was the princess of the Pharaoh at this time, uh, was the most powerful, probably, man in, in the whole world, Egypt at this time. This Pharaoh had all the power. So he wasn't poor. They were building treasure cities for this man. Treasure cities, places to, ho to house his treasures. So why would she come down to a dirty river to bathe? <laughs> because the river, it was a God, of course. But she wasn't coming down there to bathe. She was coming down there because she wanted a child. And as far as she knew, guess what? Yahweh gave her a child. Because guess what? She goes down there and continue to read. And her maidens walked along by, by the riverside. So that's a clue. There's the daughter of Pharaoh, and she's got maidens. Now, I don't have any maidens. I'm just, do you have any maidens? In, does anybody have a little? No. So she's got an entourage. She's got people that take care of her. Go ahead. And when she saw the ark among the flags. So Yahweh point, put her gaze, uh, I'm trying to form the right words. He caused her to see that ark among the flags. Go ahead. She sent her maids to, to fetch it. She said, now you go get it now. 
she didn't go get it, but she said, yeah, go get that for me. Go ahead. And when, when, she saw, when she saw had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy wept. The and baby she, wept. And we'll find out that Yahshua later on is going to fulfill that very same thing where he says, well, I learned it as Jesus wept, but it was Joshua who wept. Mm -hmm. But I'm digressing a little bit. Go ahead. And she had compassion on him. Why? Where would that compassion come from? Because she wanted that child. And Yahweh put it in her to, to have that compassion. This is not a story. This is just not a haphazard thing. And we used to sing a song called, This is Not a Haphazard Event, or a Secondary Scheme. But it was a plan of Yahshua to redeem. Continue. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So how did she identify that Hebrew child? Did he have on a, because he had on a, wasn't he wrapped? So according to the movie, and he was, he, he was in a Hebrew claw. And he probably was. But I tell you what, it didn't matter to that to Pharaoh's daughter, whether he was Hebrew or not, even though he was circumcised, because she wanted a child. And as far as she knew, she had been given the child. Go ahead. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter. Now, wait a minute. How is this young woman who is probably, I already said now, she's got an entourage. And she's, you already heard she's Pharaoh's daughter. How is she even allowed to be in the company of this princess. Right. You, you have to ask yourself questions. So she's talking to her. Now she's, she, she already had her maid to go get the, the ark. So wh why would this young girl be allowed to even talk to her? And it's, and it's because, guess what? She was in employment, probably. She was being paid. She was one of those maidens. Continue. Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew woman? Now, she, obviously, this was a familiar thing for this maiden. She said, shall I go call a, a nurse? And, of course, the Pharaoh said, who are you to talk to me, Pharaoh's daughter? She said, who are you to talk to me, you lowly girl that's on the, you know. She, what did she say? That she, that she may nurse the child for thee? Mm -hmm. And what did the Pharaoh's daughter say? And the, Pharaoh da and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. She and said, the, yeah, go. Like, it, there was, to me, it, it, it rings as there's a little familiarity there. Right. She said, go. Go ahead. And the maid went and called the, the child's mother. So she probably didn't have to go too far because the child's mother was also in the employ of Mr. Pharaoh and Mrs. And Feral daughter, Junior, well, <laughs> like for better for better description. But go ahead. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, "Take this child away and nurse it for me." So and, Pharaoh's say that again, please. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, "Take this child away and." So she she commands Moses's natural mother, who gave birth. See, this is why I said this is not a haphazard thing. It's so set up so beautifully that the very um, child that was supposed to die is being brought up by the daughter of the man that gave the death decree. Mm -hmm. And that the people that, that are working for him, Let's continue, because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for words here. Go ahead. Take this child away and nurse it for mm -hmm. me, and I will give thee thy wages. And she gets paid to do it. So she's gone from, and, and that in itself is a, is a resurrection, because what we'll learn here is she put the child. Um, I want to show how that this, 1 Corinthians 15 can you get that real quick? First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Um, Luke, give me Luke 24, 27 real quick. 
Luke. And then mm -hmm. Luke 24 and 27. And beginning at Moses. Oh, and who said that? Yeah, sure. Back up a little bit. Let's go up a little bit and want to identify who, who, who's talking right there. Go ahead. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart. Who said that, though? So now yeah, we need sure. to go back up a little bit more. Because you'll find out, okay, let's just say this. We'll find out that Yahshua is talking to these, these, these guys. And he's telling them, he says, now you can pick up, oh, fools. Now, this is Yahshua speaking to these, these, these two gentlemen that are on the road. And then he said unto them, oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Okay, so obviously there's been prophets all the way down, speaking about Yahshua the Messiah. Go ahead. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things? To suffer what things? His death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because this is after that event. Go ahead. And to enter into his glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And be beginning at Moses. So Yahshua said, okay, now I'm going to tell you, tell you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to give you a little explanation. He says, and beginning at Moses. And all the prophets. So he began with Moses as I was going over here. And all of the prophets. So the prophets being uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Obadiah, um, Ezekiel. And you notice they all have the names of Yahweh Elohim or Yah or El. All of those prophets, they carry the name of Yahweh Elohim. And he began with all of those prophets. He began to what? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. He expounded. He went into great detail because we'll learn what words mean in this school. He went into great detail. In all the scriptures. In all of those scriptures, the scriptures being the law, the first five books of Moses, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then the 34 books of the prophet. Now you're saying right there when you read that, that Yahshua is saying that he exp expounded unto those men in great detail all the things about him in those books, the scriptures. So there's something in here that we got to pick up about Yahshua the Messiah. And that's why I began in Moses. Now, when we go to 1 Corinthians, and I, I'm going to be down soon. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which so, I preached unto you. So there's a gospel that's being preached. Go ahead. Which also, or good news. Go ahead. Which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Now, Paul is talking here. Go ahead. By which also ye are saved. So... This is good news, and you are saved, where well, you should be standing in it, which is what we should be right now, standing mm -hmm. on the very thing that we were given from the very beginning, because the things that we are hearing now, we, you can't stand in it, because it's, it has no foundation. It's just, it changes like, like a snake. It's, it's, it's forever changing, and they've got to figure out a way to catch up, to, to, to explain it, to make it right, and it just doesn't fit. And you know what OJ's... Lawyer said, if it doesn't fit, <laughs> you must be quit. No, go back. I don't want to get too far off. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You got to keep in memory. Now, it's not us that's keeping in memory. It's right. Yahshua the Messiah. Downtown. Keeping you where you were from the very beginning. Be thankful for that that you are here, that you're not in all that confusion. Now, we, we don't, you, you could be out there in the world still believing that Jesus is your personal savior, and you could be in this, some of these schools who are cults now because they don't believe the very thing that was given to them from the very beginning, and that Yahshua is your savior. And that's what we're trying to profess to you right now. That's why you have the story of Moses. Moses didn't die and wasn't just put in a, in a, in a 
um, an arc of bulrushes and slime and pitch just because it was a cute story. No, it's pointing up to Yahshua the Messiah, and that's what these arrows are pointing to, Yahshua the Messiah. So you've got her identifying him in that, that arc. She pulls him up. Now, the fact that the babe wept, that is to, that's a resurrection because that's a sign of life. She takes him out of that ark and pulls him up. He was, he, was down in, he was down in a dark um, basket or whatever ark that was, full, that was dark as pitch. That's like right. being in a dark land. Right. She pulls him up out of that. That's a resurrection. And what do you do with a baby? Do you just stand there and be like this? Because, you know, you see men on TV like, ah! No, they take that baby, and, they, and she took that baby up, and that baby was, that's a resurrection. Then she said, take him and nurse him, and that's what a woman does. She puts him on this side for a few minutes to the law, and she puts him on this side to the prophets, but it's all here in this, in this holy place. In this holy place, in this holy place where we should be standing as that babe being <sighs> nursed from the law and the prophets. And, and there's a whole lot more, but that's just a brief testimony because that babe goes on to become a type and a shadow of Yahshua the Messiah. And everything that Moses does is pointing to Yahshua the Messiah. So now when you read the story of Moses, you're not reading about something that's going, to, um, that's going to give you some inspiration down the line. Oh, I'm just going to pick this and talk. No, you're reading about Yahshua the Messiah. you got to keep that Moses, Yahshua. And it goes for all of those prophets, all the way through, all the way down. It's pointing up to Yahshua the Messiah. That's where we are, folks, because now they're denying the name of Yahshua. And Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation. You take the name away, where is the salvation? There is none. You got to think about that, people. Mm -hmm. With those words, I say thank you. And thank you, Dr. Player. And at this time, I'd like to call on the Dean of the Lansing Branch, Dr. Terry Walsh. Okay, well, thank you. Well, good evening. I'm very glad to be here and see you folks here. Yep, very good to see you folks here in class, and I certainly enjoyed the things that the previous speaker said that we've been covering. Um, I had uh, uh, mentioned to Dr. Klingscales that I would uh, cover a topic that uh, we'd talked about a little bit and something that was related to some things that she had discussed uh, earlier. And that has to do with really who you are and how you're made up, your soul, and what the relationship is between that inner part of you and your creator. Um, because, you know, she had mentioned how that when her husband was on life support, uh, even the, uh, was it a nurse or somebody that was there that had dealt, deals with these kinds of end of life situations regularly, you know, mentioned that the essence of who he was was no longer in that body. And uh, that's, you know, sometimes hard to grasp, right? Uh, and so forth. Well, one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't, Realize, and I'll just mention this about Dr. Kinley. Dr. Kinley was known to kind of have a habit of going off by himself and sometimes getting behind locked doors and just leaving his body and traveling. And he would do what people call soul travel or what is called astral projection. And uh, there were times, apparently, when he would, 
His body would just be completely knocked out, looked like he was dead. And he was, his consciousness was somewhere else. And in, there were times when he would actually appear to people. Um, and this is something that is very uncommon uh, in terms of people's ideas about it, but it's not impossible to do. And I've known other people that have said that they have done very similar things, only not under conscious control. Um, and really, in a way, if you look at the soul travel or astral projection, when you go back to the situation here with Moses, we very often read in Exodus, the third chapter, that Yahweh Elohim appeared to Moses in a flame of fire as an angel here out of the midst of this burning bush. And when he told Moses to get back down into Egypt, he specifically said, come now. He didn't say go. Now, if his presence would have been really here at this bush, so to speak, if that was where he would have considered himself to be, if I could say that, then he would have told Moses to go into Egypt. But he specifically said, come now, therefore, and then I will send you unto Pharaoh. Okay? And he said, I am come down. Okay? And, and, and I'm there and I know their sorrows and so forth. So he, he was physically here, but he was able to project himself out here in a vision. And there was another time which uh, needs to be understood that he, and, I, and this was Joshua the son of Nun, who was Yahshua, who was Yahweh in a body. And this Joshua, the son of Nun, and by the way, that's part of the reason why you have this tent drawn here. Um, and this is supposedly Joshua's tent in the land of Egypt. And you see Joshua or Yahshua here with Aaron and with Moses. And they were in that tent, and this is where Yahshua then met with them down in the land of Egypt. Now that tent is quite important, and, and I'm not going to go into a whole long story about it, but this tent of Yahshua was a tab. What's another word for tent? Tabernacle, right? And this was the tabernacle, also called the tabernacle of the testimony in the Bible, that was the tabernacle of the testimony or tabernacle of witness before the big one was built. Okay? And this was Joshua's tent or Yahshua's tent, and he was with Israel during their journeys in Egypt. And when they got here to Mount Sinai, uh, they sinned against Yahweh very grievously. Moses intervened so that Yahweh didn't wipe them out completely. Yahweh had told Moses, he said, get away from me. He says, I'm going to kill them all. But Moses intervened because he was a type and shadow of the mediator, Yahshua the Messiah, which would intervene for believers on behalf of them with Yahweh so that he would save them from the wrath of Yahweh. And Moses then intervened, but nevertheless, there were still consequences to their uh, uh, sin and act. And part of the thing was that from that point on up until this tabernacle was built, which was a year after they got out of Egypt, okay, an entire year, and they stayed here at Mount Sinai during the time that they were building this tabernacle. For, so till the end of that first year, they stayed right here at Mount Sinai. And Joshua, or Yahshua, camped outside of the rest of the people. The people were not allowed to camp next to the mountain. It was considered holy. But Joshua or Yahshua camped right here on the backside of the mountain. Okay? Anyway, in the process of this, when Moses went up into Mount Sinai, you can go in the Bible and read that Joshua went up there with Moses, and you read this, you know, and you can document it on his second principal trip. Now just follow me on down, okay? Moses took how many principal trips up Mount Sinai? Three. Three principal trips, okay? And on that second principal trip, which you read a lot about in Exodus, the 24th chapter, and it goes all the way on down through the 31st chapter, you get to some other things. But during that time period, Joshua or Yahshua is up here with Moses giving him a vision. And Joshua walked up there with Moses. But 
after they came down, and they were down here for 40 days and nights, okay, they were up 40 days and 40 nights, then down 40 days and 40 nights, then they went back up 40 days and 40 nights. It's 120 days, right? Okay. When they went back up here, Joshua did not go up with him in terms of walking up there. But he did go up there with him in this astral projection. Dr. Kinley kind of described that. Do you remember how Dr. Kinley described that? If anybody read the pamphlets? He took the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> took the elevator, right? In other words, instead of walking up the stairs or walking up the mountain, he took the elevator. In other words, he, his soul, uh, or just elevated. elevated, okay, and went on up there and appeared to Moses in the vision on that third principal trip and so forth. So, and there's this and there's other situations, but I'm just pointing out how that the soul can be distinguished from the body. And in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the scripture says there... Uh, that um, Yahweh's word is so sharp, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I see you're looking it up, so if, if you have it, go ahead and read it out of the scriptures. And while you're doing that, you might as well also get 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, if you would. Hebrews, Hebrews 4 and 12. 10, I believe. I can start at 10. Okay. Well, wherever it talks about it is the word of Yahweh is sharper. 12. That's 12. Thank you. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful mm -hmm. and sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Okay, now the word of Yahweh is able to pierce so sharply that it's able to even divide between the soul and the spirit. It's, e it's able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit, which we'll get into. Please read. And of the joints and the marrow. And of the joints and the marrow. Go ahead. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the word of Yahweh can discern the thoughts and intents of man's heart. See? And the word of Yahweh, folks, is not supposed to be woo-woo out somewhere floating, right? I mean, he is present within his believers, okay? So the word of Yahweh is able to do this. But the point is, I'm talking about here, he's able to pierce and make these distinctions and divisions and so forth. And Dr. Kinney would talk about, use, the, use this scripture and talk about the veils that are in the tabernacle. Now here's what I mean. Let me illustrate to you, please. When you go into the tabernacle, you have a most holy place, holy place and court round about. And the, there are veils in between the most holy place and the holy place and the holy place and the court round about. And they are called dividing veils, okay? Compartmental dividing veils, okay? Now, of course, the most holy place and the holy place ended up being part of one building, okay? And, of course, even the court round about as a courtyard was part of that entire structure. But there were divisions or, you know, areas of distinction here, okay? And the word of Yahweh is able to make those distinctions. And if you and I are going to know and understand Yahweh and his purpose, and if we're going to understand ourselves, we have to understand things by this pattern and understand that there's dividing veils. And recognize what those veils are and where they are, okay? So you got to understand something about the compartments and you got to understand something about the divisions in there in order to get an understanding. Now, this chart gives you a great example that everybody is familiar with and that's how the tabernacle pattern compares with your own physical body so that you can take something that you live in every day and experience every single day of your life and take that by this pattern and understand many things about Yahweh, okay, in terms of the way they are manifested in a physical way, okay? You have a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity, just like the tabernacle has a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. And this is what Yahweh has done with this teaching. He's taught you. So this is why, as, as Dr. Kinley was talking about, Yahweh, and he's citing from Romans, the first chapter, that uh, uh, he's given us the natural to understand the spiritual so that we are without excuse. 
right? So that we are without excuse. So the, as we sometimes say, you can understand Yahweh and his simplicity by the one, two, three of this pattern, okay? Because you have a one, two, three head cavity, chest cavity, and abdominal cavity that compares, see? Now, that eliminates your excuse for not knowing Yahweh. Right. And uh, if you don't have one of these, you can be excused, okay? <laughs> but as long as you have one, then you are literally a witness yourself, okay? Now, the part that we need to deal with in more detail is to understand that this is just an outer man. But there is an inner man or a spirit being, a soul, that has identically the same form, the same pattern, the same function. And Dr. Kinley talked about that soul, talking about how it fills, how it takes on exactly the same form as the body, and it fills every part of the body so that the inner man and the outer man have the identical same structure. Okay? But, of course, the soul is able, under certain circumstances, to be separated from the body, just like we just cited, right? Okay? And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but go over to 1 Corinthians 12. 12 and 1. Please. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. Mm -hmm. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren... Oh, I'm sorry. I, forgive me. I said 1 Corinthians. I meant 2 Corinthians. My error. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the first verse. I just wanted to get you one more scripture in the Bible that shows something about this. 2 Corinthians 12 and 1. Yes. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Now this is Paul writing to these people. Okay, go ahead and read. I will come to visions and revelations of Yahweh. Now, Paul had already come to visions and revelations of Yahweh, but he knew that Yahweh just kept working with him. See? And uh, one of the things I want to mention, just real quick so you understand, and you can go back in other parts of the scriptures and find out about what Yahweh did with Paul. It's an amazing situation, but it's part of his purpose. When Yahweh converted Paul, and Paul was converted from being an absolutely evil fellow, he persecuted the assembly of Yahweh, and Yahweh turned him around, and it was... Partially because Yahweh intended to take somebody that was clearly not a nice fella. You, you follow me? Yeah. Clearly, can I say, I don't want to use more common words. I mean, he was clearly wicked. Clearly evil. Clearly satanic. And what he did was he took him and made a complete turnabout or change in him and turned him around and went exactly in the opposite direction in the, for, in, the, in the format and the manner that he had been before. Okay? And when this happened, he appeared unto Paul in a vision and did a conversion with him. And I could show you back in the Old Testament exactly types and shadows and allegories why it had to happen that way and in the place that it did and why Paul had to be born out of the tribe of Benjamin and where he was converted all these things are in the scriptures. It all follows this pattern if you really understand it. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that when Yahweh did this with Paul in particular, then Paul says that he did not go up to Jerusalem immediately to those that were apostles before him, but where did he go? He said, I went into Arabia. He said, I went into Arabia. Now that's the reason, folks, why this chart has this written down here, right here. Mount Sinai in Arabia. Because Paul went right back here to where Yahweh took Moses up in this cloud and gave him the vision and Paul received his, at that point, directly from Yahweh there too. But Paul's expressing here that even though he'd come to visions and revelations, he, he, Yahweh wasn't finished with him. So he says, I will come to visions and revelations, but he had already had experience. Okay? Now if you'd go ahead and read. I knew a man in the Messiah more than 14 years ago. Now who was that man he's talking about? He's talking about his, himself. <laughs> See? 
Whether and he, so he doesn't say, that was me 14 years ago. Yeah. It's like he's a whole new creature at this point. Yeah. And he says, but I knew a man, you know, an old man. <laughs> There's a new man and an old man, right? And you're supposed to put off the old man with his ways and put on the new man who is formed after the image of Elohim, okay? But anyway, he says, I knew a man in the Messiah about 14 years ago. Please read. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. What do you mean? This, I knew this man, but when I'm relating this subject here about him, this thing that happened, I don't know whether this man was in his body or out of his body. Well, this is, I'm trying to express to you that this is the way Yahweh works with someone. And Yahweh was dealing with Paul spirit to spirit, just like he was dealing with Moses spirit to spirit here. And if you read about Dr., the way Dr. Kinley describes himself and Moses and the other situations that, that occurred, Moses had to lay his body down, right? And that body was completely dormant, as if it was dead, during the time that Yahweh was dealing directly with him. And how long was Moses up here in this mount during that? Forty days and forty nights. Now, I'm going to mention something to you, because I, I want you to understand things, not just read words. Okay? Moses was up here 40 days and 40 nights, and it said he did neither eat bread nor drink water. Now, you can survive 40 days and 40 nights without food if you're properly prepared. Water ain't going to work for that period of time. And then Moses had the strength to get up and take these tables of stone and come on down the mountain and, and do all the things that he did. And he was down here and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then he went back up 40 days and 40 nights and did neither eat bread nor drink water. Now you cannot do that physically under any circumstances if your body is functioning. So Yahweh basically took that body of Moses and just laid it out and he just like suspended it, so to speak, in, a, in an eternity type of state. And what he's doing is dealing soul to soul or spirit to spirit with him. Paul had experienced this kind of thing, so his body was irrelevant. So he said, I knew this man, myself, in the Messiah above 14 years ago. Whether I was in the body at this point or out of the body, I don't even know. Yahweh knows. I don't even know. And it doesn't really matter. But the point is, Yahweh's dealing spirit to spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to understand the distinction here. Okay, please read on. Such a, such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now, he says, this one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, this is another thing that you'd never figure out on your own, neither would I. There are not seven heavens, there are three heavens. And the third heaven is the realm of eternity or the day of Yahweh. It's a state not of endless time, but timelessness. See? So, he's in a state that is completely independent of time. He's in the eternal day of Yahweh. Please read. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or not, I cannot tell. Yes. Yahweh knoweth mm -hmm. how that he was caught up into glory and heard unspeakable words, which it is not possible for a man to utter. Now, in other words, Yahweh gave him vision and revelation, and what he showed him and made him understand was beyond expression. You understand? He says it's impossible for a man to utter. It's kind of like putting it this way. If you've seen Yahweh in that high state, it's beyond what you can describe. Have you ever seen even a physical uh, 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 place, a uh, picture maybe in the Rocky Mountains or the Grand Canyon or some just gorgeous waterfalls or some natural beautiful situation and you see that and you're just absolutely struck by it but how do you describe that to somebody how do you put that in words follow me it's beyond expression 
So this is one place in the Bible where you would go to document the fact that, as we say, that Yahweh is incomprehensible and inscrutable. Follow me? Okay. It's beyond our ability to express and, and comprehend just with the, you know, okay. Go ahead and read on. Of such a one will I glory. Now, of a man in that condition, I'll glory in him, but it's not expedient to me in this physical body to glory about me in this body. But I tell you what, in that state right there, yeah, that's glory. That's Yahweh's glory. Go ahead and read. Yet of myself I will not glory. Yet of myself I won't glory. All right. Now, um, yeah, finish up just a little bit there. And I, then I want, uh, uh, Tim, if you would please get uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20. Well, I'll start at 21 and then go through 23. <clears throat> but in my infirmities... Yes. Okay. All right. Now, if you get First Thessalonians 5, and I'm going to get this board because I'm going to need it. Go ahead and read that, please. You wanted me to start at 20? Please. 21 is fine. Okay. 21. First Thessalonians 5 and 21. Mm -hmm. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Now, if you're teaching, you want to prove all things, but actually, if you're learning, you want to test all things. And that expression there really means that you need to test everything find out whether it's true and hold fast to that which is good okay um, I mention that because you see until Yahweh shows us the truth we don't know how to prove it right right and right. and sometimes I know we've misquoted Dr. Kinley uh, and and said that he said that you prove all things to your satisfaction that's not what he said. Right. He said, you make me prove it. And actually, this was part of a larger statement. He said, I received a divine vision and revelation directly from Yahweh. You make me prove it to your satisfaction. Now that's, you follow me? There's the meaning of the thing. Okay? You couldn't prove, you wouldn't even know how to prove whether Dr. Kinley had a vision from Yahweh or not. Right? right, right. right? Yes. Okay? But he can prove it, and how does he prove it? He brings back proof, witness, evidence. He is able to uh, show things that you know you didn't know and couldn't have figured out on your own. Therefore, how did he get them? He didn't come up with them on his own. He must have got them from Yahweh, the revealer of secrets. Okay. All right, so continue on. 22. Yes, sir. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Yes, abstain even from the appearance of evil. Go ahead. And the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. Yes. And I pray you, Yahweh, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Now, he said there, I pray, Yahweh, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, this is what we're going to have to work with a little bit. And there are these dividing veils in here. Just like we just read that the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful, see, and it's able to make these distinctions and divisions and understand some things. Okay, but you're not going to figure it out on your own, neither me. Okay? It's got to be something that Yahweh has revealed. And how does he give us a way to verify and confirm it? There's the natural things, such as your body and, and the pattern that you do, you and you compare spiritual things with spiritual. You take the natural to understand the spiritual, then you compare spiritual things with spiritual. Or in other words, you compare the principles that are in one manifestation with the principles as to how they manifest on a higher plane or on a spiritual plane. In other words, the things that you have in your body, you have in your soul. But you wouldn't know anything about your, the things in your soul by looking at them and feeling physically. But you can take the things of the body and if you understand, like I said, that the soul fills the entire body, has the same contours and, and, and outline and form and function and so forth, then if you know something about your body, you can understand something about your soul. 
Do you follow me? Okay. Now, so I want to deal with, with this a little bit. And the first part of this, just very quickly, very quickly, because you've got to take the natural to understand the spiritual, just on the most basic level, okay, you can compare the body with, by the tabernacle pattern. Now, if you don't do it by the pattern, there's no way of really understanding it. This is the way Yahweh has given to understand it is this pattern, see? It's what he used with Moses, it's what he used all the way on down through, okay? This is Yahweh's gift. Now, in the most basic sense, the tabernacle was a threefold structure, okay? Now, you can get into all kinds of other detail, but in the basic way, it was a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout, all put together in one tabernacle, okay? Your body has a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity all put together as one person, okay? And that's the body part of the person. Make sense? Now, yes, there are arms and legs, just like there were extensions of this tabernacle. There are, and, and you can compare all that by the pattern, but I, don't, I can't go into all the details today. There are seven steps in the tabernacle, seven in your body, okay? There's nine vessels, there's nine in your body, and so forth. We'll get to a couple of these things. I just want you to start by taking something that is very fundamental, and then we will go on up to the spiritual part. Because I want you to know something about your soul and about Yahweh, okay? So that you don't have to be, well, I think maybe, well, okay, well, possibly, well, I don't know. There's no need for that. Your excuse is gone, okay? Because Yahweh has shown it, and now he's teaching it. And then you need to check it, as we say, check it out. That's the test it. Follow me? And if it fits, then that's the way it is, okay? All right. And unless you've got some better explanation... You're going to have to take it the way Yahweh gives it. Make sense? And if you do that, boy, I'll tell you, you can make some major progress. Okay? All right, now, so the body has three primary parts. And I'm going to deal with the body here, okay? Remember, spirit, soul, body. That's one, two, three, right? Okay, let me, you won't forget that, right? Now, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to do it this way. We're going to talk about the spirit. We're going to talk about the soul. And we're going to talk about the body. The body is the part that you can see. Okay? And you know that the main parts are the head, the chest, and the abdomen. Right? Now, if your soul follows exactly the same form and pattern, then the soul has to be threefold too. And it has to be compartmentalized in things that are identical in form, structure, functioning to the head, the chest, and the abdominal cavity of the man. Do you follow me? Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to give you some words for this. Okay? And these are things that people talk about and, and, and so forth. The mind has sometimes been called the soul. The heart has sometimes been called the soul. And the will, the soul is the seat of the will. Okay? The mind, the heart, the will. Okay? Some people talk about this in, in a, and this is a kind of a broad general thing, and I wouldn't say this is totally the story, but you can think of it this way. Your mind deals with thoughts. With your heart. Your heart is involved with your feelings. And then... When you exercise your will, you're putting things into action. Thoughts, feelings, and action. Okay? The mind, the heart, 
the will. And that compares, doesn't it? You think of the brain in your head as the place which is the seat of your mind and the center of where uh, your thoughts are, are used. You talk about the heart in the chest, and sometimes people say, oh, my heart aches, and they actually feel, when they're feeling an emotion, they feel it right here, okay? So you can understand that that soul that's doing the feeling, it's, it's reflected in the physical body, see? So, and then the, the, the abdomen, okay? It's, the, you realize that the abdominal area, and I'm talking about the entire pelvic girdle here, then this is the, the, the foundation for action and movement of your entire body, you know? They try to take us people that are really out of shape and teach us to exercise and get our core in, you know? And, and boy, oh boy, and that's that, that whole area in here, right? That core has to be strong in order for us to take the proper action and movement, right? And so forth. Okay? So you can see that there's a comparison here between the soul and the body. With the head, the chest, the abdomen, the mind, the heart, and the will. Okay? Now, it's a little more abstract when it comes to the spirit, but there are things that are identified about the spirit, and you can go in and look at the way Dr. Kinley has identified parts about it. Spirit is pure principle. I did not say he is principles. That's not a plural word. He is the ultimate principle behind everything. Okay? In other words, anything that exists, is a manifestation of some principle. And that ultimately is about Yahweh or spirit. Make sense? Pure principle. Then he talks about spirit as being the attributes. Now that's plural. Okay? Attributes. Okay? And he talks about nine and I'm going to use a word, nine principal attributes. Look, folks, and I'll deal with the nine principal attributes later, okay? Nine, would you spell the word principle for me? See, I just spelled principle here. Spell principle here. That's correct. It's not P-L-E, it's P-A-L. There's a difference, okay? The words mean two completely different things. This word means primary or high level, okay? There are nine of the highest level or principal attributes. There are other attributes, too. But those attributes, the other attributes, are products of the nine principal attributes coming into a, another formation or action. Okay? All right? And this means the ultimate precept, the, 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 the point. Okay? This means the primary things. They're nine principal attributes, the primary attributes, okay? There are secondary attributes, and I guess I'll just mention this now. I'm not going to have time to get into all the details of this. But do you realize that the Holy Spirit takes these nine principal attributes in a person, and these nine principal attributes are in everyone, okay? Now, they don't show up in the way that people think, but they're there. In fact, they're actually in the rocks. That's hard to understand, I realize. But that's because you have to understand that the rocks are really nothing but a manifestation of spirit, and they're spirit materialized, and so even the rocks show a principle about Yahweh. You follow me? When Yahweh created things, Okay? He took these attributes and made them, and I'll put down the, the third part of it here so I can complete this. The source 
and the what? Substance. So really, you see, it's the attributes that become the substance of everything. And I realize it seems strange, but even this chair is spirit materialized. Okay? You wouldn't call this spirit. But it is spirit that's undergone a whole series of changes and now manifests in this particular form. You follow me? Okay. But because the spirit was ultimately the source and the substance of everything. But these nine principal attributes, which we'll talk about later, also, if a person has the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in a person takes these nine principal attributes, which are in the soul, or which form the soul, and these nine principal attributes which form the soul have a product. And the product of those attributes with the Holy Spirit is called the fruit of the Spirit. And the scriptures list the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm saying fruit, not fruits. Follow me? Now I realize the word fruit can also be a plural word all by itself. Right, But the Bible in Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it contrasts the fruit of the Spirit with the works of the flesh. Okay, And if you go through in there in Galatians 5, you'll find out he lists nine principal fruit of the Spirit. And those things are a product, the fruit of the Spirit of these attributes, okay? Operating where Yahshua is, as the Holy Spirit is in a person and the person is therefore, the soul has been changed or translated into the kingdom of Yahshua. Now, I just said that, put that in your memory bank and we'll have to talk about that later because we're not gonna have time to talk about that in any detail today, okay? Might mention a couple things. The fruit of the Spirit is a product of these attributes. Now, if I put the other part up there, remember, we're, we're, we're comparing, right? Most holy place, holy place, court roundabout. And I said here that, see, the spirit, right? And then soul, and then body. Do you see how I'm doing that? Okay, all right. So, then Dr. Kinley goes into some detail and talks about how it's these attributes which form your soul. Okay? And there's places where he adds some other words that go beyond the nine principal attributes, but the nine principal attributes are there. Is everybody following me so far? Making sense? Okay. So, now what I want to do is I want to deal with the soul in a little bit more detail. Now if you will ever get this understood in a way that is clear in your mind and workable, this will clear up so much confusion about all kinds of things in the Bible and in your whole understanding of Yahweh is just amazing, okay? Now, I'm going to use a picture on the charts. This picture is here in a couple of different places, but we've been working with this green chart, and over here on the left, we see Yahweh Elohim as the archetype pattern of the universe, from which everything else is a manifestation. Now, Yahweh Elohim appears here in a spirit embodiment, a superincorporeal form, kind of like he appeared to Moses in the visions on Mount Sinai. Okay? Now, when he did this, he explained himself to Moses by showing himself in a man-like body, an anthropomorphic body, but it was superincorporeal. In other words, it did not have physical counterparts are flesh and blood. There is no flesh and blood in this spiritual or spirit embodiment of Yahweh Elohim. This is not just a spiritual body, it's a spirit embodiment. 
This is actually the embodiment of Yahweh or spirit. Now let me put that in another way. This is Yahweh embodied or Yahweh expressed. The Bible talks about him as being the image of the invisible Elohim. And I would say that this is the only image that Yahweh Elohim has of himself and any other image of him is a false image and if you worship any other image, that image is an idol. So this is Yahweh Elohim's self-image. Follow me? And if we are going to worship him in spirit and in truth, we need to worship, honor, glorify, understand and relate with him as he really is and actually exists, not just the way we want him to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't get to make God the way we want him. We do not get to make Yahweh Elohim in the image of what we think he should be. We must end up conforming to his image and his will because we are never going to change him. Follow me? Okay. He's not going to conform to our will. I don't care how much prayer you got. Okay. If you pray against his will, you ain't getting an answer except no. Okay, anyway, that's kind of a... But this is the image of Yahweh Elohim as shown in a visionary form. Now, he explained himself in these visions by this tabernacle pattern so that there would be something to relate with himself. So in himself, this image has a head, a chest, and an abdomen, so to speak, and a most holy, compared with the most holy place, holy place, and court round about of the tabernacle pattern. And then everything else he shows compares by the pattern back to him. Make sense? Now, you may not be able to see it. You can look, come up close on the chart and look at it later if you wish. But in this formation here, you see those nine principal attributes put into this spirit embodiment. And I'll diagram them on the board so you can see them better Okay, in a minute. One thing I want to mention is that the man over here, which is made in the image and the likeness of Yahweh Elohim, I already told you that man has a body and a soul, and both the body and soul come from the spirit, which is the source and the substance. The spirit is the source and the substance of both body and soul. So it's the spirit that makes up the soul and makes up the body. You follow me? Okay, just like we talked about the spirit even making up the chair and the rocks. Okay? All right, but over here, you also see the nine principal physiological systems, and you see there's more physiological systems than these nine. There are. Just like there's more attributes than the nine, but these are the nine principal attributes. And these are the nine physiological systems. Now you can take these nine attributes in these nine systems and you can compare every single one. And I'm talking about intimate detail. Very great detail. And the third volume of the Elohim book does a pretty nice job of describing a lot of that. Okay, Very nice job. So you can get from that a good description of how each attribute compares with each system in the body. Okay? And this is not just words, this is the way you're made in the image of Elohim physically. Now, how are you made in his image spiritually? Well, these attributes, the same attributes as him, which form everything else, are also the attributes which form your soul. And I'm going to diagram them out over here. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, you have intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge. I'm just using three letter abbreviations here. Okay? These three go together. Everything is threefold. Okay? Like this, the spirit we said was threefold. 
principle, attributes, source, and substance. Then you have what are the attributes here? Beauty, right? Love, and justice. Then that's a triad. All right, what is the next triad? Foundation, power, and strength. Okay? Now, in this formation, folks, these attributes are connected and, and, and they're fixed. In other words, the formation is set. That's why Dr. Kinley talked about it this way. He said Yahweh Elohim first existed without any descriptive shape and form. Then he took on a shape and a form. And the attributes, which were without shape and form in the original state, came into a set position. Now this shows the set position of those attributes, so their relationship here is fixed, unalterable. Okay? And for this creation and this purpose, Yahweh will not alter the pattern. He will not change the relationship among these attributes. Okay? Follow me? Now, If you look, then what you've just seen, I guess I can use the same marker. Eh, I'll use this one. If you look then, these deal with the area here. Then you have these here. Everybody always laughs at my drawing, that's okay. But what you just saw was Yahweh Elohim take on shape and form of a man right before your eyes. In, in a picture, in a, in, a, in a diagram, right? Okay? And now there's the head, the chest, the abdomen, right? There's the mind, the heart, the will. Let's just see if that fits, okay? Because I said... Your soul, made like him, there's the mind, the heart, and the will. Okay? Well, let's just see if that fits, based on the way that this is described. Okay? Intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge. Don't those things deal with your mind? Right? Your thoughts... Okay, what you could also call, if you want, you can use another word. We said thoughts, people talk about it that way. You could also use another big word called cognition. These are things that deal with your cognitive, the part of you, the cognitive part of you, the mind. Okay, all right, now, beauty, love. Judgment, which is justice, same thing, okay? Don't you see how those deal with one's heart? Okay? Okay, you talk all, all the time, oh, I love her, right? And, 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 and you know, I, oh, I love her and that's it, she's my heart, okay? All right, so these are the feelings which in a broader sense is emotion. Okay. Now, foundation, power, strength. You use power fortified against something that has a strong a strength to resist the force of the power, right? And you have to have those based on a foundation in order to take action or carry out your will. Okay? So, um, let me just use another very broad term. And I'm doing this partially just so you can have something to remember. 
So that's how you put things into operation. Okay? Now I kind of like those because it gives me an understanding that what this is here, this soul, it's your C E O. <laughs> okay? We think of a CEO as the chief executive officer. Well, he's the one that's functioning, he's at the helm, and so forth and so on. But it's the cognition, emotion, operating, thoughts, feelings, and actions. And you can see how those correlate with the attributes, can't you? Okay? Now that you've done that, you should be able to see that in here, Yahweh is sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, he can make distinctions. Now, you've already actually dealt with some of the distinctions by recognizing that these things deal with the mind, while these things deal with the heart, and these things deal with the will. Okay? You've made some distinctions here, lines of demarcation, as he talked about it. But there is another uh, uh, set of phrases that Dr. Kinley used when he talked about what makes up your soul. He talks about the attributes, and then he talks about your attitude and disposition. Can you read this pen? Probably not. Starting to fade out, right? I don't know if I've got, I brought some other pens. I don't know if these are any better. Found these. Let's see if these work. No, not really going to be much better. Attitude and disposition. And then here, he talked about your con... Boy, that, was, that pen is not going to work, is it? I'm just looking for a different color so that I can put it... You got... All right, let me try that. Nope, not really. These lighter colors don't show up so well. Thank you. Conduct, that'll probably show up. And, thank you, sir and behavior. All right, so I'll go back and rewrite this one. Attitude and disposition is the veil between the mind and the heart. It's at the veil. And the conduct and the behavior is between the heart and the will. In other words, if I, I could put it like this. The way you translate what is in your heart into operation is by doing it through your conduct and behavior. Make sense? Okay. And the way the things that are in your mind and the things that are in your heart, the way those things influence or affect the things that are in your heart or the things that are in your heart affect the things that are in their mind because you go right, right? It, it goes both ways. It has to do with the way it affects through your attitude and your disposition. Okay? okay? People can have a thought about something but depending on their attitude and their disposition, they can have very different feelings and emotions about that very same thought. People will be faced with the same facts, and one person will react to them and receive them. The other person will react to them and reject them. And folks, that is really the key when it comes to this teaching. All we can do is present you with the truth. But based on what's in you, and based on what happens here, you're going to either accept it or reject it. And it's going to have a permanent effect. We are not dealing with just, oh, something that goes on as part of your life. This is your life. And it is what is going to determine your eternal life. It is that important. This is why you need to make sure you are clear about this. And once you recognize, I couldn't have 
figured that out, and I couldn't have presented that any different, and I couldn't have whatever, whatever, whatever. You need to accept it. And you need to deal with it, and then take it from there and work with it, because this is a tool. This is given to you as a tool and a way of relating with your Creator. Okay? So anyway, this gives you an idea of the way your soul... Uh, is formed and function in both the three parts as well as the veils in there. Okay? Now, that may be good enough to get us started on another conversation related to it. For a moment. Do you need it? No, I was going to put it back. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. I don't know if everybody can see this. Think of your body as a vessel, like this cup. Let me get a drink again, please. Think of your body as a vessel, like this cup. Okay? And the body has the head, the chest, and the abdomen. Right? But without the inner man, this, right, it's empty, it doesn't work, it doesn't function, it's not really a person. The whole person has to be spirit and soul and body. And just like this cup, called spirit is in the cup called soul that's the way it is with you the spirit is in the soul and the soul is in the body now I illustrated to you that it is possible to do soul travel right okay and the body's just laying out there okay but to be a whole person, your spirit and soul and body. Now, the spirit, you don't necessarily see all the things about spirit. But just like we wrote, spirit is the ultimate principle. It is the attributes. It is the substance. And I don't know if you can see it, but I've got this little orangish cloud around there showing that spirit is really just stuff. Like this cloud right here has no particular shape and form. Okay? Now, when the spirit takes on shape and form as a soul in a body, then you have a whole person. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, the soul has the mind, the heart, and the will. And of course, that's in the body that has the head, the chest, and the abdomen. Does that make sense? Okay? So, your body, your soul, your spirit go together to form one you. Okay? Now, Once this takes place, what has to happen is that the whole thing has to work. Now, I'm going to run out of time today if I start getting into a lot more detail. This is not something, you know, I think we've covered a lot in one hour already, haven't we? Okay? But this is a subject that you could take and look at throughout your entire life. And it would be worthwhile for us to spend some more details on this, okay? Now, I'm going to mention something, a couple of things real quick. Dr. Kinley talks about this, and he goes back into the Bible, and in Genesis, the first chapter, and the second chapter, and so forth, and where he talks about that he formed the man's body from the dust of the earth, okay? Then it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Now, Dr. Kinley said before that he was a what? Dead soul. 
a dead soul. That's exactly right. In other words, he was just a body. And the word soul in the Bible can be applied just to a body. Okay? We usually think of it as applying to the spirit part of us, the inner man. But he was a dead soul before he was a living soul. Now that breath of life, folks, is also called the spirit of animation. Okay? And that spirit of animation or the breath of life was in all the animals. Just like it was in the man. And the animals all became living souls. A lot of people, for some reason, seem to think that animals don't have souls. Well, you don't read it in the Bible at all. And they have spirit. And it talks about it in the Bible, about the spirit of the man and the spirit of the beast. Okay? And I could go into the Hebrew words, nefesh kei and so forth, and where it talks about living souls, it's the same as moving creature. But when the Bible translators put that together, of course, they wanted the man to be extra special. So they translated it into English for the man, living soul, where with the animals it said moving creature or creature that has life. But it was the same words originally. What Moses wrote about the animals and the man was the same thing. I want you to understand that. So the doctrine that says that Adam was a living soul and every other person is a dead soul based on the expression that Adam was made a living soul, that's not accurate. That's not the way to show that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. The breath of life is the spirit of animation or the quickening of the body. Now folks, the spirit of animation can move a body and make the body breathe, but that doesn't mean that the mind and the heart and all that of the person is really there in that body. Just like this person observed to you when she said, the essence of what makes him, Doug, is no longer there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just like I illustrated to you earlier that Dr. Kinley would lay his body down and the, what made him who he was could travel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so that's one thing. Then he talks about the fact that what he did is he imbued both the animals and man with universal spirit law. I'm using words. And that universal spirit law gave them instincts and a disposition to care for their offspring. Now that's in animals, that's in man. Okay? You follow me? That's not the Holy Spirit. Just like the breath of life is not the Holy Spirit and not the soul. I'm trying to get you to understand these veils and the whole structure here. Because otherwise, you'll make assumptions that are wrong and then based on those assumptions, you'll be off on a wild tangent. And you can get into a false doctrine and it'll lead you straight to hell. Now, after Yahweh has made one, what happens is, just like here, there is a seat. Now the seat, the throne, is not the most holy place, but it's in the most holy place. And the throne is there for the purpose of Yahweh sitting there and being served in that tabernacle by the priests and everything that operate in the tabernacle. But, folks, if Yahweh's tabernacle or temple is defiled, 
He will not live in it. And this tabernacle had to go through a whole sanctification process before Yahweh moved into the tabernacle anyway. All right, so what happens with us is, after we're born, what happens is a spirit being takes the position here and starts being served in each one of us, in our souls. Do you follow me? And I want you to understand, and Dr. Kenny went into this and it's in the scriptures, but Satan was here exalting himself even above the cherubim and he was there in the cloud first before Yahweh had him cast out. And it was the moving in of the Holy Spirit which cast out the satanic spirit. So, this person here can become possessed of a satanic spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, that one goes. Do you understand? Now there's a whole series of other things you can do where slightly over time, so I don't want to take any more. But I want you to understand that much. And we, you know, when you really start talking about some of this stuff, there's a whole lot, isn't there? Oh, yeah. yeah. And we've scratched the surface, and I think we've done it in a reasonably organized way. Have you learned something? Okay. Something you didn't fully understand before, as well as you now see it. I hope you have, okay? And I hope it's helpful to you, and I hope you don't just leave it. Now, what we should do in all our classes is go back home and then review some of these things briefly within 24 hours. And then we can take it from there and then do more. You'd do that in your classes in school, wouldn't you? Okay? And, it, well, if you're good at it. If you're making A's, unless your IQ is like 180, you know, you're doing some kind of review. But I tell you, that works. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. I said after we're born. I said after we are born, living, okay, Breathing, the whole shot, okay? Then what happens is one spirit being or the other takes up residence, but never two at the same time, never the two opposite. Satanic spirit can have all kinds of fellas in there. Follow me? But the Holy Spirit and the satanic spirit, as Dr. Kinney put it, don't get along too well, okay? And it's, that's what the scripture talks about, that he casts out the satanic spirit. Okay, so basically what happens is, well, I'm sorry, I, I'll say it very quickly. What happens is children become indoctrinated. Now, they become indoctrinated long before they start listening to preachers in church. The world starts teaching them things from the moment they come out of the womb. They start getting impressions. Children are the most voracious learning machines that there are. They learn faster than us as adults by orders of magnitude. It's just that what they are learning are things we're not aware that we're able to measure in an academic sense. But they're taking it all in and it's starting to form everything within them. And then what happens is based on certain things Dr. Kinley talked about this too. Then their brain starts out, and this is an analogy, as if it is smooth. And then it gets crinkled. And I'm, all I'm saying is, it's like you start developing in specific ways. We're talking about what the brain uh, scientists would say, you start developing neural pathways. And those neural pathways become fixed. And folks, that's just a physical manifestation of what's happening in your mind. Your brain and your mind aren't the same. But your brain tells you about your mind. You follow me? 
So those connections, those pathways, those associations start to become fixed through your experience in life. And then you start to develop customs and traditions. And those customs and traditions become set. And those things are inevitably products of a world that is contrary to Yahshua. And it has to be changed. All right, I don't want to take any more time, but I hope this has been helpful. And it's something that we have to talk about some more detail in the future. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Welch, for your comments or questions. You can hear it in the wind as it blows through the trees. You can see it in the wings Please of a bird Please do not enter the room during free. moderation, prayer, or reading of the scripture. You can see it in a there is a spiritual operation going sky. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fundamental and regular instructional meetings are posted Every on the whiteboard. A reminder that our school is supported by our members. Pledges are due at the beginning of each so month. Donations sing. are welcome, greatly appreciated. Hallelujah. Please see the treasurer from the public director. Public Relations Director Hallelujah. will be on Ustream, Let's we're on Facebook, YouTube, and LansingBible.Weebly.com. Direct your donations for the Ustream project Hallelujah. is greatly appreciated. Uh, special Hallelujah. events and postings are on the backboard for Springfield, of which um, there is only is a Overflow no Hotel. Oh, I think no, no. if you're still going, you can get banquet tickets. Every color that he painted, he painted it. And then the North Side, North Side no. Chicago event for April 4th. And his signature Friday, is seen on Sunday, everything he made. What is yeah, yeah. the only name for salvation? Even and then you for we every have breath you breathe, you breathe his living name. Tuesday, August 19th through Sunday, August 24th. So let's all stand and be dismissed. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Hallelujah. Quoting from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Hallelujah. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua Messiah, our Sovereign, belong So let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, 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 let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing.